do their duty and fly out. And I'm okay for them to fly in. I'm not okay for them to fly out, right? Because when they come in and they do their, this should do this, this should happen here, and then they just leave, right? They just created a mess. Well, we now need to, you know, this adjusted the whole scenario. We need to now uh, reconcile what, what, what's happening. Uh, so seagulls is kind of my term for, for when that happens, uh, and I do my best to avoid it. I want them to come in. If you want to come in and, and be a part, uh, have your, your, your say, which most times will always happen, you cannot avoid it, but you want to also bring them in. So if you're going to come down into the trenches, let's do a walk through the trenches so you can get a context, so then we can understand what you're trying to implement what you're trying to communicate. Because oftentimes what happens is it's the crux of the definition. Oh, I think it should perform like this. Okay, well let's let's talk about that because I don't think you, you may not be aware we have 10 other things that we are working on that are more important than this one right now. But we will get to this and we can see where it fits in the priority. So seagulls is uh, a, a funny uh, term. And it's not just exact. It's it could be anybody. Anybody that comes in and just makes your life a mess. Uh, from you know, hey, wait a minute, you need to come back and let's let's have a conversation. Sounds like Tom
team of rock stars will beat most teams that have a few superstars. Because those rock stars are able to actually communicate well together. Uh, uh, a story that I have is uh, I met a guy, and he point blank told me I'm looking for a team of superstars. And with my filter already uh, to it, I was concerned. Because I've played on many soccer teams where I've had more than a few superstars. And we were all superstars. And we did not work very well. You know, everybody wanted the ball. Nobody wanted to pass. We didn't have very good trust and boundaries with each other. Um, and, and that really hurt our ability to, to be successful. But I've also played on teams where we had a lot of grit rock stars. You know, passion and drive to accomplish it. And that kind of team is the team that succeeded more than not. And we uh, had a good time at it, too. You know, it was, it was something, the most enjoyable experience I've had. And I've seen that actually happen in business, too. Where I'm working with a team of technical business people, and we're motivated and excited and working well together. We accomplish far more than we could ever imagine with one or two superstars pulling the wings. Back to my story was the uh, superstar. Uh, he got a team of superstars, paid for a team of superstars, and they didn't work very well together. Uh, at the end of the day, they weren't aligned. Um, they all had different um, perspectives and ideas of what should happen. And none of them really drew the definition line, saying, I'm going to work here, I'm going to work on this, I'm going to this, because we're all working that's something you want to be aware of too when you get into the business, looking at roles within companies. How do I fit into this? How do I, if I'm a superstar, how can I be aware of how to work with other rock stars? Yeah. Matt, you mentioned there at the bottom that trust being a kind of a key binding component of building that alignment as a team. In your experiences, what are the the most important things you can do within the team setting to help build and cultivate trust among your team? That's something that uh, I deeply believe in beyond the scope of effort. Whatever you're working on, it's got its own challenges and issues, but how do you work at the human level? How do you connect at the personal level? You know, how, how do you build a or you don't have to be super excited about the person. But how do you get a good balance of how was how's your day? You know, what do you feel about this? And oftentimes a simple approach from a question perspective, how do you feel about this? What do you think about this? It then can start to have a conversation. You on the receiving end start to feel, hey, he listens to me, or she listens to me. And that starts to build the trust of, hey, I'm, I'm being heard. It's not to say that I, you won't be challenged either. Um, oftentimes I do the same thing when I'm working with a designer or I'm working with a programmer. I say, uh, what's happening here? Give me more understanding of what's happening here. If they don't understand it themselves, then I can't come in and say, well, it needs to change. This needs to change right now. That actually starts to break down the trust. If you don't trust me right away. And in some cases, uh, those simple things really mount up uh, and become a problem for a team. And so I think it's the small things. I always look at uh, you know smiles and uh, how you actually present yourself to the person, right? How how you sit. I mean, these are all really uh, minor things in some of our uh, minds, but our mind really can pick up those those elements. And so I do think it is one of those of a team that uh, trust needs to be there. I trust that you're going to be working on it. But I also know the context. You know, you're not going to be perfect at everything. And I'm not going to be perfect at everything. Okay, great. We're in this together. Learning. Surprise, surprise. Uh, my learning has not stopped since not believe you guys should ever think that would happen to 
since I left school, um, in particular on the technology side, Facebook came out. Facebook did not exist before I, I left school. Um, all the different um, technology services that we took for granted, analytics, um, a lot of the ad networks, Yahoo peaked and is falling. Bing has, has emerged. So a ton of things have happened. And one of the things that I'm learning is the ability to adapt. So technology I learned, I think I was first starting on ASP.NET, very beginning. And I heard of a thing called PHP, uh, Java, when I was doing studies. And those are still around, but they've also morphed. And there's a lot of different services out there. So while I can learn and do the actual programming, I also have been able to adapt and learn the, the context of that program. PHP, open source, oh, well, there's an equivalent in the non-open source. And I need to weigh out and start to understand what are the differences between them? What's the fundamental differences? Right? It's not just one is free. But what is the uh, support on one? Maybe I do want to pay for it on free one because the support of that one is worth the value. So you start to adapt and understand. So what you learn physically in this class, you be willing to adapt when you need this when you go into the work environment. Absolutely. I understand what, uh, you know, hey, SQL, SQL. What environment am I going to be looking at? And what are the tools that I can start to use to do it? Um, and the competence to teach. Uh, and this is an area that you don't really learn it until you can teach it. And sometimes I've even learned more when I teach it because I get questions about it that I have to think about. Okay, well, my assumption may have been this, but maybe I should investigate it a little bit more and really get the answer. Uh, I say all the time, let me triple check it. Right? I've already double checked it. Let me triple check it because guess what? It's changed. Everything. And where you grow, the team grows. And sometimes you need to grow in an area to really help the team grow even more. And I've done this in many areas. Uh, when I started at Microvision, I knew nothing about photonics, nothing about optics, uh, electronics, nothing about mechanical uh, engineering. But I seeked out about product management and what is this whole discipline. Uh, and I seeked out uh, you know, pragmatic marketing. I, I bought videos, uh, online websites. I still do that today. I'm on Google Analytics every day, uh, Google AdWords, Facebook advertising, all of these different tools. I've taken an active engagement in my learning on those. And I'm way beyond uh, many peers that have gotten a business degree or a technology degree, and now they, you know, they start to become antiquated because that technology is moving so fast. Um, I'm sure Evan and Neil has even mentioned the, the, the progress, right? The, the speed of computing power. You know, my iPhone can do so much now. You know, GPS, make phone calls. You know, I can make a call with it, but I don't very often. I do a lot of other things. Search the web, check my email, GPS, but we still call it phone. It's a phone as well. But over half of phones now are smartphones. They're all computers. They're all capable of doing a ton of things that, you know, when I was in school, uh, it was just a glimmer in the eye of, wow, I can make phone calls wireless. Never would have thought I could make it even. Uh, but my point here is, Continue to push yourself. When I was a student here, I often pushed myself further and was allowed the freedom to take a project further, uh, explore it, certainly meet the requirement, what's good enough, but then also what is better. How do I invest in myself while you have the time? It is so much harder, now, uh, trust me, uh, to do a lot of this learning and, and uh, education after hours, after you're working especially if you have a family. Uh, the last thing you want to do 
after work is more learning, but it is something that uh, is again an advantage. One more slide. So questions. And I'll start off the question. And it's first to you guys. You know where you are going. Uh, when I was actually an accountant at Eddie Bauer, I had in my car, in my wallet, don't today, but it was a, a, a note to myself, where am I going? Right? Every time I open my wallet, I see where am I going, where am I going? And it's one of those things that, uh, it's, it's your heart to heart because it's, it's your heart and your mind. You need to, to, to talk to yourself, where am I going? Where do I see myself going, either in the business and the technology? I learned where I didn't want to go. But then I also was open to explore new opportunities. Uh, so sometimes where you really want to get to, you can't go straight there. Right? If I want to go to Spokane, there's a variety of ways I can go there. But I still have to go across the mountains, through the desert, and then out. And you need to be flexible on understanding where that is but also mindful of how you can control it. Right? Sometimes, hey, I want to go explore this area a little bit further because I, it's close to this. And things that I learned here, I think I can apply over here. Uh, and in some ways, it's your product plan. What is your career product plan? And literally, how do you put it on paper? And how do you communicate it to others? Right? So it's not just bottled up, well, this is what I really want to do. Good. What are you doing about this? And how do you get it? Uh, my current role as a uh, digital content manager, marketing manager, was uh, very deliberate. Uh, I said, this is kind of the role I want. And I pursued it aggressively. Uh, and it didn't just happen. I had to get some of the, the skill sets and the strengths to be able to achieve it. So that's my first question to you guys. And certainly, I'm open to any questions that you So when you're talking about um, enabling people to want to do things, how do you enable them to do something that without forcing it on them? Yeah. It's uh, in some cases that's uh, there's no single way to do it. A lot of times it will be contact. Uh, and when you look at the team and the dynamics, right? Every job has a part of the job. It's not going to okay. There's always going to be some element that is less enjoyable. But if there's a commitment that, hey, we all have to take the trash out every week, right? OK, we do it. Um, but for the benefit of having the luxury to do other things. Uh, so in, in some contexts, I've experienced um, you know, motivation is a big element of all of this. How, how you motivate others to achieve it. As a product manager, I didn't, I couldn't wield a heavy hand on anything. I couldn't say, it must do this and you must do that. Couldn't do that. It had to be a lot of it through communication, persuasion. Um, one of the things that uh, opinions are often hard to break, I, mean, I don't think we should do this, but if you have some data to support a different opinion, it's not necessarily an opinion. Right? And how do you start to use data to influence others to, to meet a goal or an objective? Um, so I can't say in that context that there's a perfect, uh, perfect strategy. Um, I've often had to pull away from opinions on things and get to data. Well, I think it should be blue. I think it should be red. OK. Well, can we do a study and see if there's a preference? Or can you explain why you have an opinion, why it's blue, and what data do you have to support why it's blue? So, speaking of blue, have you heard of the Google links color blue? Yes. Do you know, can you share what, what that is? Well, what I'm thinking is that they said that the worst color to make a link is blue because that's the hardest thing for you and I to see. There's, it's close. They did a study and said, is there a color that people will click on more than not? So blue is a color that actually people do click 
click on, but then it's what shade of blue. So they did a study specifically to understand, okay, is it a bluish green, is it a, a deeper blue, and they actually ran a study. And they found that a specific shade of blue had a higher statistical uh, uh, data that says people click it more. And it was relevant to their business because more clicks. They make money through more clicks, so it makes perfect sense for them. Now, if we just left it up and said, well, I think red is perfect. Well, I have some data to suggest red is not a good one, especially culturally based uh, and also readability. But then you can start to get data to support an argument rather than just make yeah. like every link red. What shade did they like? They liked the, it was current, current blue on their Gmail right now. So if you open up Gmail, I, I don't know the hex of it, so the hex color. Is it bright? Is it dark? Um, it's actually more, I think, of a pale. Yeah. It's more of a pale. That's what they told us in our design class, that it's more energizing, the light, light Correct. blue. Yep. Yeah. Good question. Anything else? Yeah. Um, on, it's really the project management. Okay. Uh, have you managed a product or a project with multiple team members? Yes. Okay. So when you're when you're trying to balance the time that you have in a, in a short amount of time, so you've got a month to do something. Yeah. You know, how do you prior how do you prior, prioritize uh, the amount of time you spend planning the project before you actually start doing the project? How much? What's what's the ratio? Good. Good. Uh, good question. From an industry ratio kind of perspective, they're vastly different. Uh, I don't have any any numbers I can cite off the top of my head. The projects that I was involved in are in consumer product, there's about a year cycle to uh, the life of a product. Okay. Uh, but that also varies depending on the type of product. I have, I have a TV that's lasted five years. And the more planning you can do, the better. Because in the life of the project, as you get further in the project, you're spending more and more and more money and time on that product. And sometimes, as many companies find, products don't meet the mark when they get to the final end. Either features or uh, whatever. It could be a host of things. But the planning 